Hi, this is Sarah Arder at the LaSalle Public Library. It is August 15th on 2000, in 2008, 18, 2018. Um, I'm here with Paul Marincic and uh, here for an interview for the Illinois Veterans History Project. This is in partnership with the, the uh, Library of Congress and this particular project as part of the LaSalle Library's Project Next Generation. So, welcome, Paul. Um, Hello. Let's let's start off. Where and when were you born? I was born February 27th, 1947, in LaSalle. It's uh, St. Mary's Hospital, but I'm from Jonesville, Illinois, which is right outside of Oglesby, and I've lived there all my life. I bought a house a block away from my parents, except for what. Two years here locally in junior college and two years up in Northern, so I've got those two and then the two I was in the Army. But other than that, I'm all local. All right. And um, about your parents, who were they from around here? What, what were their jobs? What were their occupations? Well, my father was in business with his brothers. Uh, my, his father came from Austria and like 1912 or something, I had did my grandma, uh, and my dad was uh, in the Navy in World War II, a veteran of World War II. Okay. And do you have siblings? Yes, I have a brother who's younger, and he uh, got married young, so he went in the reserves, and two younger sisters. And were either of them in the military? No. No? Nor, nor their husbands. Um, now, what were you doing before you first entered the service? Well, I, this was during the Vietnam era, obviously being born in 47, and uh, had a deferment through college, uh, but I knew as soon as I got out, I'd uh, get drafted, so I, for job opportunities, I right here in Peru, next to, to La Salle, and I had a job offer for West Clox, and rather than take one out of town and have to move and get an apartment, and I decided to stay and live at home after college, knowing that I'd get drafted. So I graduated the first week in June and got drafted the 5th of December uh, from West Clox. And because of the GI Bill, I came back there, and the, I was glad I did because I came out, got out in 71, they were starting to uh, wind down Vietnam, so there were a lot of GIs coming home, so jobs were harder to find, so I'm glad I had the GI Bill to, uh, or protection, job protection, to, uh, kept my job, and I worked there another eight years before I found another job. Yeah, West Coast? Yeah. yeah. And when you did enter the military, uh, which branch were you? I drafted in the Army. Okay. Uh, but when I was in the AFI station in Chicago where they induct you, uh, went through the whole physical and the testing and everything, and uh, when this room be sworn in, it's an interior room, dark, platform on the front with a flag, and a, officer in the uniform, a lieutenant, or wherever he was, and we were going to be sworn in. We had to line up in rows, and uh, he said, okay, before he started, he went down the row and started counting at the end of the row. One, two, three, four, five, six, Marine. One, two, th he puts the finger on the chest of every six guy they got drafted in the Marines, mm -hmm. and I'm about in the third or fourth row. <laughs> I really didn't want to go in the Marines, yeah. uh, so I got drafted in the Air Man. I wasn't the sixth one in the row. <laughs> so that just, was it, was it the whole row of people that got drafted and then they picked the Yeah, school? everybody was getting drafted, okay. being sworn in. And okay. uh, it was just with Branch. So he right. designated beforehand, before he got sworn in. And even then, Marines was probably the most hardcore. Yeah, and while it was in Vietnam, you were yeah. worried about, everybody was uh, sure. uh, apprehensive about coming home on a, Coffin or something. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, so after after you got sworn in, was there a waiting period before you before you headed off somewhere or no? That was office? the day we that was in Chicago, the AP station. We flew out that night on a charter plane, a whole plane full of draftees, and we landed in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. That's where I took basic training. It's the home of the 101st Airborne. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So did you did you head off there with a whole group of people that you were that you were lined up with, or were yeah, you kind of all? No, that whole around? group. Uh, I think flew out on that plane that night. That, oh, wow. that uh, as far as I know, I. Because there were like 600 guys went through the AV station that day, okay. and obviously they can't fit 600 on a plane. Right, right. Wow. Um, so when you did head off for training, um, what what was it like? I mean, you you, you took a plane, landed landed there. Did they just kind of group you together and just kind of say? Well, we had an experience of. Uh, It was out of Chicago. We were flying, and it was a commercial plane, but it was chartered, no uh, class section or anything. And one of the guys it must have been drinking or something. There were two, two stewardesses uh, on the plane, and we wanted fruit or anything, you know, just a hop, skip, and a jump to Kentucky. Yeah. And he pulled one of the stewardesses on his lap. So they went and locked themselves up. The pilot called ahead. We land in Fort Campbell. The MPs are waiting. Their whole flights are going. Line us all up. You know, that's us the riot act. Uh, and I had a little pocket knife. I always carried. You know, uh, they made it. Took confiscated everybody's knife and everything. And I'm there. For eight weeks, they're going to teach us how to kill people with bayonets, weapons. Hand grenades and rifles, but we can't have a three inch, two inch pocket knife. <laughs> no. But they were, read the riot act to us, make sure we were, and it's one guy ruining for everybody. Uh -huh. <sighs> okay. The, the one guy with the, with the students. Yeah, 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 he was. <sighs> he took it upon himself. Um, yeah, you know, we're all smart. Guys from Chicago, where I'm 100 miles away in Cornfield, I don't, you know. Uh -huh. uh, but we're all classified. You can say the army mentality here, all hell. Sure, sure. Oh, funny. Um, so when you actually got there, what were what were you guys doing during the first days? First couple of days was just all testing, get your hair cut, uniform, uh, getting indoctrinated. Uh, you really didn't start basic till like a week after. And then, uh, in our case, uh, the cadre, you know, the drill sergeants, drill instructors, uh, they wanted Christmas off because they'd been working these eight-week cycles. So, uh, we were, it's unusual that we got a week off. We got to go home for Christmas and New Year's, and they bust us up to Chicago, and uh, we got to come home for Christmas only after being in for three weeks. Split up basic training, and then that one guy in our company. Uh, well, there was a busload of guys out of Miami. And our, we had 250 guys in the basic training, and uh, another busload out of New York. It was, it was just, uh, I, we weren't the only ones in basic, just our. Yeah. Uh, but one of the guys, you know, I said it was a difficult time with the Vietnam War and this one kid didn't want to get stay in so we, were, we had our uniforms had a name tag and I think we get out of the bus in Chicago he walks down the street goes in a pawn shop buys a handgun walks further down the street sticks up a liquor store with his uniform with the name tag on hoping to get out of the army you know the cops picked him up we learned this later we got back to basic and forced, I can't even remember his name, so-and-so. Uh, about a week later, here come the MPs with him, emptied his foot locker out, sent him back to the start of another basic training oh, cycle. No. So he had to start all over again. Oh, no. 
that Jed says you're going. Yeah. And we all you know, laughed at him. That didn't work. No. Oh, man. <sighs> oh, so uh, the, the instructors that you were working with then, were they hard? Did you have some pretty difficult ones? Did you, did you well, some? they were all uh, combat infantry had been to Vietnam. They were all E6s and up, so they were uh, career. Tough guys, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and they, you know, they want to train you so that you didn't get killed. Sure. You know, that was their job, to equip you and train you uh, to make you a good soldier. Uh, they, you know, they, they harassed the heck out of you, but that was the goal. Yeah. Um, do you, is there any particular ones that you remember that stood out? or? Just, uh, was it all kind of a blur for part of this? Well, no, I don't know. The oldest guy, he was like 41 of drill sergeants, a single guy. And it was going to be his last cycle, he was going to retire. And he uh, he was the oldest guy. He was the PT instructor, the, the physical. He was the most in shape of them all. Uh -huh. And uh, he was going to retire and he was going to go work for the post office because he could, that would carry on his federal pension or whatever. Uh, he had a brand new Thunderbird. Parked in everybody who got his new car. Oh, very nice. Um, while you were there, did you go through specialized training too, or was it all? Was it just? I mean, was it just basic training? Basic training, and because I had graduated college, generally you go to basic training eight weeks and then eight weeks of AIT, Advanced Individual Training. Uh, but because I had a degree. And did my I had two cousins preceded me uh, in the army, and they said, "Don't for all, do the best you can on your tests." Although all the jokes about the army, it will help you uh, get placed well, or whatever. So I did, and uh, I ended up and didn't have to go to uh, AIT. Uh, they assigned me to Fort Carson, Colorado, and I ended up being a, as a personnel clerk. So, a personnel clerk in what capacity? Like, what were you? What, uh, Fort Carson, we had 40,000 troops there at the time. 5th Infantry Division mechanized, the APCs, the Army Personnel Carriers. And at the time, there were three posts in the country that were. Well, our mission was to be on the runway in 12 hours with all our stuff. There was Fort Benning, Georgia, 82nd Airborne, Fort Carson, Colorado, 5th Infantry Division Mechanized, and uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Those three were designated. If something would happen in the world, the war would start. We were the first ones to go. That was the mission of the post. Uh, so all our records were in four drawer cabinets, but there were four blocked together. Uh, so I was a, took care of the records of uh, Artillery battalion. Well, I was only there three months, and they sent me to school because you could only uh, get as high as PFC and E3 uh, without going to school. So they, I would. They didn't. The warrant officer I worked for didn't want me to sit there. And never. I was already at E2 when I went there. You know, out of basic training. Uh, so he signed me up for a personnel school and. Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Indiana. I worked there for, or stayed at Carson for three months. And was ready to go to school. In the meantime, I came down on a levy for Korea. So I did the uh, schooling, uh, secured us leave and route. And then right, I went home for three weeks after the schooling and then went to Korea for 13 months. So. This this being directly following this this eight weeks. Oh, yeah. yeah, I went for eight weeks of basic. Then I went right to Fort Carson, Colorado, just regular, there. yeah, uh, personnel clerk, and the, I was there for because I got there my birthday, February twenty seventh, uh, in Fort Carson, and I was in. Uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison, month of June. It was three weeks and three days of uh, personnel. 
and I graduated first in my class there in 84 uh, as being the top graduate. Again, I took the advice and that helped me. And uh, the, the good thing was, again, being, you know, with Vietnam, uh, still didn't know they could sign anywhere, uh, but with having spent the time and effort, money training you, that was called a guaranteed MOS, they couldn't make me a cook or an infantry because they'd invested the money in that schooling, you had to be a personnel clerk. I was a personnel management specialist was the mm -hmm. class, so I lucked out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, you, when you started into all of these things too, was it easy to adapt or would you, the physical regimen and the li living situation? No, well, I, you know, in high school I was out for track for four years. And, uh, Football for two to, and we went in basic training in December in Kentucky, and it, it snowed, it was cold, so we did a lot of physical, but it wasn't a hard track practice, you know. Uh, that didn't, I was in good shape, young guy, I mean, that, that wasn't a problem. That's good. <laughs> um, so, moving on to where you did serve, and so you went to Korea for 13 months, you said. Yeah. Correct. So where, where was this? Where in Korea? Uh, I was assigned to, it was in Seoul. It was the 8th Army Headquarters, Yongsan Military Reservation. Uh, we had a four-star general, uh, John H. Michaelis, Jr., and he wore four hats. He was United Nations Command, 8th Army, uh, U.S. Forces Korea, which is all the services, and uh, it was KMAC, or all the Korean Military Assistance Group, which had uh, some foreign. There were some Turks, and I don't can't remember, uh, small contingent of different countries that still had troops stationed in Korea at the time. Mm -hmm. That was in the 70s. Uh, and when you when you were over there, were there any kind of immediate memories or things that that, that stuck out? When you, when you got to, I mean, was it nothing like anything you'd ever seen or something? Well, uh, when I was in Fort Carson, one of the guys that worked with, in the same office as me, you know, with the records, uh, Sutherland was his last name, he had just came back. When you get drafted, you get two years. If you were enlisted, you get three. And a lot of guys enlisted at the time because they could get that guaranteed MOS they signed up for to stay out of infantry in you know, Vietnam I was there. Uh, so he was a three-year RA, and he'd been there, so I got knew the ropes from him, and uh, I bought a book on Korea, so I'd done a little research. And, but when I got there, we landed in, well, we went, flew to Japan first, and because uh, it was a long flight from Seattle, 12 hours, uh, and then a hop up to Korea, but. And, and MASH had come out while I was in Fort Carson, the movie MASH, because I remember going to the theater and uh, a couple of officers were offended by them and their wives and walked out after the movie. Really? Yeah, the original MASH, not the TV show. But, okay. uh, uh, Just because they thought it was... It, it, not as derogatory to the Army, you know. Uh, but when I landed, we landed at Kimpo and that we were going to be bused to the replacement station. And uh, my first thought was, you know, you saw the movie, and, and, and uh, this is no movie, this is real. Along the, the way there were people living in, can't call them houses, just concrete blocks stand, stacked up with uh, corrugated tin over the top. I said, this is no movie set. This is the real thing, the shock of how poor people were and the country was. Yeah. Um, so when you were in this situation, did you, were you pushed into any kind of combat action or was it? No, was it not there. I was a personnel group. We had a familiarized with our weapons in M16 and that, but, uh, and we had a, well, even now they have the big uh, annual exercise uh, with uh, the one that Trump just canceled this year. Uh, 
so we, we played the war games for that for a week or two, I don't remember, but uh, other than that, it was just, and I was fortunate, again, with the doing well in the schooling, at the time we had 60,000 troops in Korea then, there's 24 or something like that now, uh, we had 6,000 officers, and I was in G1 personnel, we were right behind the commanding general's building. Uh, and of those 6,000 officers, there was one guy who got their assignments home, me. That's all I did was make sure all the officers in the country went home. So I wore my dress uniform in the headquarters, uh, and I didn't have to pull, well none of us, because there were uh, house boys did all the work, you didn't have to wash your clothes, make your bed, anything, you paid them four bucks a month. Yeah. <laughs> the company did, they took care of it all. Uh, so I didn't, didn't have to pull any guard duty, or well, no, we didn't do KP, I don't think, maybe once, you know. So that was, was that your duty through a good part of your time there? The through? whole 13 months, that's okay. all I did was, okay. and I had a top secret security clearance because you knew where every officer was going. Sure. And uh, I'd get up, go to work first, you know, we didn't even have formation, we just went to work and uh, checked in. And I went over to the Stratcom building, strategic communications, that uh, were all the radar on the roof. Uh, satellite stuff and uh, got a print out of what officers uh, orders were issued that day out of Washington uh, brought the paper back to the office and called around and uh, gave their companies their assignments okay easy job yeah well, that's, that's, I mean, respond you know I mean, uh, very, yeah, yeah you, a lot of responsibility yeah. as well that's good um, did you do you have any um, friendships or interactions that stuck that stood out from some of your time when you were over there? Well, we, went, we had uh, the Koreans did all the work, and uh, you know they took care of the barracks. They uh, cut the grass because it was so poor. They hired people. Why waste the GI's time doing menial things? Uh, and, and the Koreans were glad to have the jobs, uh, so there were. An older couple cleaned the office, and when there was, uh, it was a big building, uh, brick building, built by the Japanese in the 30s, I think. Uh, we had a shoeshine boy, Sun Ki No was his name, and that's when James Bond, doc, we call him Dr. No, because his last name is Sun Ki No. Uh, and he had a uniform on, you know, school uniform with a little bus driver hat thing, and. He would shine your shoes and he was anxious for us to help him with English because in school the Korean kids, the English was mandatory class. And uh, he'd even stay after because we had somebody had to stay at CQ all night through the, in the building, sent plenty of phone calls, which we had to do maybe once a month, but he'd stay after and uh, we'd help him with his English homework. So, but then there's a in our barracks, there's like 22 guys in our room, and there's one guy left that we still uh, exchange Christmas cards oh, since nice. 1971. To this day, huh? to this day every nice. year. Uh, Joe Ruzan from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Very nice. So we still, uh, I, there were a couple, and then they just quit, but Joe and I are still diehards. <laughs> That's After great. all these years, he had, he was a uh, high school history teacher. He ended up being. Okay. Also drafted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he no, he was a three-year egg or three-year enlistee because in Korea and Viet, Korea was thirteen-month short term instead of two-year tour, mm -hmm. and Vietnam was twelve-month tour, and if you finished your short overseas short term. Tour with 150 or less days to go, they just let you out because you're going to hold at 30. They're going to sign you somewhere. By the time they fool around, you aren't going to do nothing because you're a short time. You're going to slack off. You know, you're not going to be. Uh, so I got a, 
I did. I got a 109 day drop, but Joe uh, wanted that 150 days because he had a year to go after he finished Korea. So he re up. He went home for a month and came back to Korea for another tour to get the 150 day drop on the enemy. So. Uh, well, in staying in touch with with him as a friend now, were you able to stay in touch with family and friends while you were actually there, or was it was it just writing letters? Yeah, yeah. 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 There yeah. was no cell phones. No yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. You could call home or something, but it was expensive as heck, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but I did send the uh, tapes home. Why do you buy a cheap tape recorder at a PX? And sure. I bought one and sent it, another one home. Uh, so we swapped uh, audio tapes. Okay, very nice. Um, what did you guys do? Did you have any time for recreation or things you... Yeah, uh, well, in my case, it was a, like a regular 40-hour week job, really. Oh, okay. uh, so we traveled around. Uh, I took a two-week leave and went to Japan right before I got out. One interesting thing, they well, Christmas Bob Hope came with the tour oh, with the with the whole Johnny Bench you see him on commercials yeah. now, <laughs> uh, and Bob Brown and the whole troop of uh, Bob Hopes, they came from Vietnam and, and hit Korea and, and, and taping the shows and uh, it was a big football field in second division, and, but also. Uh, Went to Pan Munjan, the Pru Truce Village, uh, on a bus. So we were only 30 miles from the DMZ, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, that was interesting. We had to wear our dress uniforms with our ta name tags, and they had a, a Jeep in the front and the back with M60 machine guns mounted uh, to escort us in there. We got to walk around the Truce Village. To, Pictures you see of a uh, Rocket Man uh, on TV. It's the same buildings, the same. It looks the same. This is where the, the Truce Village in Pan John. Okay. We got to go through it, and take pictures, and it's a great experience of it. Yeah. It was just a uh, bus trip. Yeah. It was a Sunday afternoon. They allow, and they, I think the Koreans, uh, North Koreans, could. Have visitors to at different times, you know. But okay. That was interesting. Enough things to do, though. I mean, oh yeah, the, the uh, I'd taken two spoken Korean classes at night because uh, I'm going to be there. I might as well. I knew I could speak. Reading it, it was, you know, the whole different alphabet. Yeah. But I learned enough to get in the cab and go downtown, and you know, uh, and then that. Uh, Shushai boy would help us with Korean. We were doing his, his uh, English, he'd help us with Korean. Very cool. Uh, so. Cool. So when, when the war ended, I mean, were you already, you were already home at that time? Or you, where, where were you when the war ended? The, the Vietnam War? Yes. Yeah, I, I got home in August of 71, Vietnam ended in 75. So, but it was, I see, a lot of troops were coming home. Yeah. They were releasing troops because they knew they were going to uh, cut it down. So the jobs were harder to find. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you, how did you return home? They just, after the 13 months you flew, you flew back and... I flew back to uh, Fort Lewis. Okay. Uh, uh, and... Got our, our pay and then uh, last chance steakhouse. We got a big steak for mm -hmm. and, uh, Since I'd been away from, I had cousins in San Diego, and you could still fly standby with your uniform. So instead of going straight home, my mom didn't like it, but I went and spent three days in San Diego with a couple of cousins, uh, showed me around, and then I went home from there. So I got a free ride to sure. San Diego for. And when you got home, um, were, was there any kind of, um, 
How, how were you received when you got home? Were you just kind of fit yourself right back into your life? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of the, I belong to both the LaSalle VFW Post and the Oglesby American Legion, and a lot of the guys like in Vietnam, they really had a hard time. They called baby killers and, you know, all the protests and stuff, but I didn't go through any of that. But one thing that was curious, I went back to my job at Westlock, same department, same place, and the people were telling me, well, we're just, all you talk about is the Army, all you talk about is Korea. You know, they were on other things that wasn't, you know, they wanted to hear some of my stories, it wasn't so much of interest to them. But and I says, hey, talk to me, but you can't talk to me about anything that happened to you in the last two years of your life. Now, what kind of conversation you you know they yeah. didn't understand that's all I'd done yeah. now, what else was I you know we got we didn't have television we got the newspaper and I subscribed to Newsweek so I kept up on you know mm -hmm. some of the stuff but the Stars and Stripes new, newspaper we got but that was good. printed by the army so <laughs> it was totally objective yeah and you said you have you've stayed in contact with that one friend of yours. Um, what what vets organizations do you say that you? I belong to the LaSalle VFW Post here, okay. and I was the American Legion I'm an officer of both and active. And, okay. And what and on that, uh, one of the reasons I have to uh, our country is in trouble, uh, with the current president too. But the, the even before the. Lack of patriotism or loss of patriotism. That's, um, I want to put a spiel in here about, uh, and most of the guys that belong to think we should reinstitute the draft. Everybody knows, or it has, you know, uh, uh, and it makes a difference in your life. You feel different about the country than, you know, than. Somebody goes to college, gets a job, buys a new car. They've never uh, yeah. done anything for you know. Freedom, freedom isn't free. You know, I was fortunate I didn't get shot at, yeah. but still lost two years of salary. You know, all, you know I made ninety-seven dollars a month when I went in. And I was making you know obviously a lot more than that as a college graduate, yeah. but. I think that they should reinstitute the draft. I know there's, uh, they said they have a higher quality of soldiers now because they want to go under one and they're tested, uh, not just, you know, because there were kids where they get in trouble and the judges say jail or army, so they throw them, you know, and so they're troublemakers, they wouldn't be the best soldiers, but uh, that's my spiel. I speak for a lot of guys. That's interesting. Um, so, generally, would that be how it how it affected how your experiences there affected your life? I mean, just kind of. Would you say the military itself was was um, the point of change where you were kind of opening your eyes to what was going on, or was it that your time over there? Or? It was time over there. You know, everybody was active the current politics at the time, you know, Kent State, you know, all the protests, you know, Chicago uh, Convention, uh, everybody was against the war, you know, uh, but, you know, again, I was fortunate I didn't, I came home whole, you know, uh, but it, it, you feel you, it's part of, you know, this is my country, I, I you know, uh, it's not, these kids come out, well, I have the right to, you have no right to do nothing, it'll snot those kids, you haven't done anything for America, all you do is take. Yeah. And it ticks a lot of us, uh, veterans off, you know. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, that, um, that in mind, is there anything you'd like to kind of close out with, but saying a, a message for future generations, or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm conservative, so that some of the, in education, there's, I think, too much liberal uh, slant. It, it's 
gone on to the left <laughs> from when I was in school. You know, we stood up, to, you know, said the pledge and, and, and with God in it, and uh, we got to lean it the other way. Okay, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And um, here ends interview. This is Paul Morensic. Thank you. Thanks.